Welcome to Old Treasures Made New, your devotional podcast on the go or at home, where we read the scriptures and reflect on them with those from the past. Today we're reading Luke 9, verses 12 to 17, and then through J.C. Ryle's expository thoughts on Luke. Please take a moment to pause and to ask the Holy Spirit to bring understanding and to apply what we hear. Luke, chapter 9, verses 12 to 17. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people, for there were about five thousand men. And he said to his disciples, Have them sit down in groups of about fifty each. And they did so, and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, twelve baskets of broken pieces. This is the word of the Lord. The miracle described in these verses is more frequently related in the Gospels than any that our Lord wrought. There is no doubt a meaning in this repetition. It is intended to draw our special attention to the things which it contains. We see, for one thing, in these verses, a striking example of our Lord Jesus Christ's divine power. He feeds an assembly of 5,000 men with five loaves and two fish. He makes a scanty supply of food, which was barely sufficient for the daily needs of himself and his disciples, satisfy the hunger of a company as large as a Roman legion. There could be no mistake about the reality and greatness of this miracle. It was done publicly and before many witnesses. The same power which at the beginning made the world out of nothing caused food to exist, which before had not existed. The circumstances of the whole event made deception impossible. 5,000 hungry men would not have agreed that they were all filled if they had not received real food. Twelve baskets full of fragments would never have been taken up if real material loaves and fish had not been miraculously multiplied. Nothing, in short, can explain the whole transaction but the finger of God. The same hand which sent manna from heaven into the wilderness to feed Israel was the hand which made five loaves and two fish supply the needs of 5,000 men. The miracle before us is one among many proofs that with Christ nothing is impossible. The Savior of sinners is almighty. He calls into existence the things that do not exist, Romans 4.17. When he wills a thing, it shall be done. When he commands a thing, it shall come to pass. He can create light out of darkness, order out of disorder, strength out of weakness, joy out of sorrow, and food out of nothing at all. Forever, let us bless God that it is so. We might well despair when we see the corruption of human nature and the desperate hardness and unbelief of man's heart if we did not know the power of Christ. Can these dry bones live? Can any man or woman be saved? Can any child or friend of ours ever come to know Christ? Can we ourselves ever win our way through to heaven? Questions like these could never be answered if Jesus was not almighty. But thanks be to God. Jesus has all power in heaven and earth. He lives in heaven for us, able to save to the uttermost, and therefore we may hope. We see, for another thing, in these verses, a striking emblem of Christ's ability to supply the spiritual needs of mankind. The whole miracle is a picture. We see in it, as in a mirror, some of the important truths of Christianity. It is, in fact, a great acted parable of the glorious gospel. What is that multitude which surrounded our Lord in the wilderness, poor, helpless, and destitute of food? It is a figure of mankind. We are a company of poor sinners in the midst of a wicked world, without strength or power to save ourselves, and severely in danger of perishing from spiritual famine. Who is that gracious teacher who has compassion on the starving multitude in the wilderness and said to his disciples, Give them something to eat? It is Jesus himself, 
ever full of pity, ever kind, ever ready to show mercy, even to the unthankful and the evil. And he is not altered. He is just the same today as he was 1,800 years ago. High in heaven at the right hand of God, he looks down on the vast multitude of starving sinners who cover the face of the earth. He still pities them, still cares for them, still feels for their helplessness and need. And he still says to his believing followers, Behold this multitude, give them something to eat. What is that wonderful provision which Christ miraculously made for the famishing multitude before him? It is a figure of the gospel, weak and contemptible as that gospel appears to many. It contains enough to spare for the souls of all mankind. Poor and despicable as the story of a crucified Savior seems to the wise and prudent, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who that believes. Romans 1.16 What are those disciples who received the loaves and fish from Christ's hand and carried them to the multitude until all were filled? They were a figure of all faithful preachers and teachers of the gospel. Their word is simple and yet deeply important. They are appointed to set before men the provision that Christ has made for their souls. Of their own invention, they are not commissioned to give anything. All that they convey to men must be from Christ's hand. So long as they faithfully discharge this office, they may confidently expect their master's blessing. Many, no doubt, will always refuse to eat of the food that Christ has provided. But if ministers offer the bread of life to men faithfully, the blood of those who are lost will not be required at their hands. What are we doing ourselves? Have we discovered that this world is a wilderness and that our souls must be fed with bread from heaven or die eternally? Happy are they who have learned this lesson and have tasted by experience that Christ crucified is the true bread of life. The heart of man can never be satisfied with the things of this world. It is always empty and hungry and thirsty and dissatisfied until it comes to Christ. It is only they who hear Christ's voice and follow him and feed on him by faith who are filled. That is the end of Ryle's expository thoughts for these verses. Let us carefully consider what we have heard today, and may the Lord be pleased to bring the growth for His glory. In considering what we have just heard, would you prayerfully ask yourself and others the following questions? First, Ryle says that this account of feeding 5,000 men is an example that nothing is impossible for God. How does this example of Christ's power encourage us in the things like unbelieving children or impossible circumstances? And secondly, Ryle argues that this miracle is an acted parable of the glorious gospel, a lost world, a merciful Christ, and disciples being given what is necessary to feed the lost. Have we tasted of the bread of life? Are we faithfully giving him to others?